Hey there! Ever wondered what it's like to share your apartment with 150 houseplants? Well, let me take you on a tour. Hey everybody and um, welcome back to my YouTube channel. We are nearing the end of summer and I thought it would be a good idea to give you an updated houseplant tour. First of all, because I've had a lot of growth, but also I wanted to let you know what sort of challenges and advantages come with the different seasons and well, currently it's summer and one of the challenges that I'm facing during summer is the light exposure. But the advantage that I have during summer is obviously a lot of sunlight hours, warm temperatures and most of the times really high humidity as well. Each season comes with its own challenges and advantages and according to that, I change my care approach, I change my layout of the apartment and different plants thrive in different ways. So so first of all, I've got a northeast facing window over here. So I get beautiful, nice sunrise. During summer, the sun rises kind of right behind me and then it goes up in the sky really, really quickly and really high, which means that the sun doesn't actually reach as far back into the room during summer as it would during winter. It really just reaches maybe to around about over here, which means that any plant on the left is really just relying on bright indirect light, which is mm, probably perfect for most of these plants. Same position during winter would actually get a lot of direct sun because the sun would be so much lower as it moves up in the sky, which means that even plants at the far end of this wall over here that you currently can't really see, even those would get a little bit of direct sun during the morning, but in return, I have less sunlight hours during winter and the sun isn't quite as strong. So it kind of works perfectly because at the moment, the sun is really, really strong and really hot. And if these plants would get direct sun, they would just burn. The plants on this side, I've got a few cacti over here. I've got my oxalis at the bottom over here. I've got a pothos over here. They definitely get a little bit more direct sun, but predominantly during the morning when the, su uh, when the sun isn't quite as strong yet. I've definitely noticed that at times it might be a little bit too much sun for them, but to be honest, I just don't really have enough room to move them out of the direct sun. I sometimes close the blind to filter the light a little bit, but then if I close the blind and the pl plants right next to the window get a nice filtered light, the plants a little bit further away from the window don't get quite enough bright indirect light. I need to find a bit of a balance and I have selected my Monstera Dubia and my Apricremnum to be the ones that I'm trying to get used to as much light as possible and they seem to be dealing okay with it. That's the main challenge I'm facing during summer, that some of my apartment gets a lot of sun and really really harsh sun and then the rest of the apartment isn't getting as much bright indirect light as I would like it to get. So I personally actually prefer winter when it comes to light exposure and I think most of my plants do as well, but winter comes with a whole lot of other challenges. Anyway, despite these challenges, quite clearly the plants seem to be thriving. So I've got my dubia over here and I've done a plant spotlight on this just recently, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but after I've chopped it and put it on that grow vertical pole, it is giving me just a new leaf almost every week and they're having amazing, nice fenestrations. Definitely turned into a really, really nice statement piece again. Right next to it, we've got my, I think it's a Cebu Blue. It was sold to me as a Cebu Blue but as it matured, it lost a lot of its silverish color. Now, somebody actually left a comment the other day, which I thought was like, made so much sense. I, to be honest, I didn't research into it to make sure if that was right or not, but they were saying that, well, as the plant matures, it usually loses the blue because the blue is actually just a mechanism to optimize light when this plant is still smaller and further down um, uh, in its journey. Yeah. So obviously these plants in nature would climb up trees and as they climb up trees, they get access to more light. So basically as this plant matures and grows up further up the tree, aka the moss pole in my instance, it just doesn't really need the bluish color anymore to optimize photosynthesis, photosynthesis even further. So it just turns into green because it can, um, which makes total sense. I'm still a bit upset about it not having the green, the bluish tinge anymore. But I think the fenestrations definitely make up for it. And I mean, if you look at it, 
there is still definitely a bit of a color gradient between when the leaf first comes out being super, super light green, then going into a little bit darker green, and then the leaves that have been a little bit older, there is still a little bit of bluish, silvery sheen to it. Not sure if the camera is going to pick it up, but in real life, it's definitely visible. Down here, we've got my Monstera Thai Constellation. Honestly, I just don't have that much to say about it because it is such a slow grower and I don't think it's really grown much since we've done our last houseplant tour. So no major update. Right next to it, we've got my Mandula Pothos and I only recently talked about that in the video as well. But I wanted to point out that latest leaf over here. I really think that leaf is slowly starting to transform in leaf shape a little bit. If you look at the previous ones, they're all kind of wider than they are long. And now this last one seems to be much more elongated and not quite as wide. I don't know if that's just random or if that's actually part of the transformation that Mandula goes through as it matures but that's the kind of thing I love growing plants for. I love not necessarily knowing what the next leaf is going to look like. In addition to that obviously it has the beautiful variegation that's also going to give me a little bit of a surprise moment. So this is super exciting for me to grow because with every leaf the plant is changing a little bit, increasing leaf size a little bit, the variegation is always different so it kind of keeps it interesting. Apart from that, it's actually quite a slow grower. Um, it's been on this moss pole for quite a long time. Alrighty, then one more plant I wanted to point out. Actually, let me give Brettles some cuddles first. So we've got Brettles over here. Let me basically let me let me address a few questions you've had a relation to Brettles. I get asked a lot what I do to keep a bread off my plants because all of these plants that I have, I think all plants apart from the oxalis, is actually poisonous um, to Cats, also us. I suppose we don't eat them, we just look at them. So how do I keep my cat off the plants? Or how do I keep bread off the plants so he doesn't poison himself and also so that he doesn't ruin my plants? But honestly, I'm not worried about my plants in that scenario. I'm more worried about my little baby, baby bread. And realistically, I do nothing. He is just not really interested in it. So yeah, I have to do very little. Sometimes he starts like, nibbling on a plant or start sniffing a plant but he only ever does it to get my attention when he when i'm paying attention to something else or like i'm stuck on social media or you know I'm, I'm watching a film and he wants my attention because most of the time he wants my attention because he wants food but if he wants attention he's gonna go for the plants because he knows that he's gonna get my attention as soon as i hear him play with my plants and, and yeah, I didn't do anything to teach him or anything like that. That's just in his personality. I do think him being not a kitten anymore by the time I started moving a lot of plants into my apartment definitely helped. I think as a kitten, he would have definitely tried and climbed everything, but I suppose that's normal. But now he's a grown man and most of his time is spent on the couch just chilling. Anyway, let's move on with some plants. I get asked a lot about this hanging plant over there. This is Anthurium vitarifolium, and it's one of the only Anthuriums that haven't really made it into my Anthurium room yet. Um, it's just hanging there. It's been hanging there for years now. This is its forever spot. Um, and I water it maybe every two weeks or so. I do very, very little for it. It just hangs there. It's not fussed about temperatures, humidity, light levels, so on. So a really, really easy Anthurium and... It's quite nice because it's very different to all the other anthuriums that I grow. Anyway, let's move on to the other side of the window. So this is the variegated Epipremnum panatum that I was telling you about earlier. It does get quite a lot of sun, which I believe is one of the reasons why the, uh, the full white bits start going really brown pretty quickly. Look, if there's full white bits like this over here, this is on a uh, fairly new leaf. There is no way it's not going to go brown eventually, right? Like this has no chlorophyll. It is absolutely useless. It is basically just nice to look at. But from the plant's perspective, this is actually bad for the plant. It can't really contribute to the survival, but it's still taking energy. So eventually this will just go brown. That is inevitable. If you give it, you know, not super harsh light, if you give it high humidity, good airflow, you can try and keep the white bits white for as long as you can, but ultimately they will go brown. So if 
can't really change anything about it. Yeah, you can really see by the stem how it kind of like curls around the moss pole. It doesn't go straight up the moss pole. That's actually because this plant kind of used to live on this side of the window. Then I move it back to this side of the window. Then I move it back to this side of the window, right? Because either side of the window, it starts pointing all of its leaves towards the light, so towards one side. So if I just rotate them around or switch them around every half a year or so, then they kind of correct themselves again and they ultimately end up looking fairly symmetrical. Um, so that's why you see the stem kind of growing this way, then back this way, now back this way and so on. So it does it by itself. The plant wants to grow towards the light. I just manipulate where the light comes from. So it gives me a nice aesthetic. Ultimately, you guys know how, um, how you know how I feel about my plant journey and you know how the reason why I grow plants. Well, because it's a nice hobby and it you know, it's a hands-on hobby, but also because I really like the aesthetics of plants. I want them to fill my space. I want them to look nice. Now, over here, I've got my Albo Monstera, and you can see that it's removed a little bit further from the window compared to this plant or any of these plants that I showed you earlier, which is probably why it's growing a little bit slower than most of these other plants and why it hasn't really increased in leaf size as quickly as, for example, my Dubia and so on. But I'm totally okay with that. I can't have every single plant grow ginormous really, really quickly. I am running out of space. So I do need to pick my favorites and wanna, and I do need to, you know, prioritize the plants that I really want to see mature. And it's not like I don't want to see this plant mature, but I think this plant with smaller leaves is also equally beautiful, right? And with this plant, I'm more after variegation rather than this uh, leaf size. And ultimately, the variegation is random. There's nothing I can do with light exposure to increase or decrease uh, the variegation, despite the fact that that's a bit of a myth that's going around. At least with this plant and the way that this variegation works, um, the light won't actually trigger the variegation. It is random. Now, what I want to show you about this plant is the craziness of aerial roots. Now, with a deliciosa, obviously, this is a variegated deliciosa, so I want to, you know... I wanted to give it a moss pole also for propagation purposes because every single node, if you look at this, every single node is growing so many roots into the moss pole. So if I ever want to propagate this, I'm going to have a really, really easy time. But ultimately, if this would just be a green version of Deliciosa, I wouldn't actually give it a moss pole because it has crazy thick aerial roots. They're too thick and too unruly for the moss pole. Ideally, you would give it a plastic backed moss pole, but I would even say that you don't even need moss in the pole at all. You could probably get away with cocoa chips or even like the beautiful cocoa choir poles. You could totally do that. It will give the plant enough support. These plants grow in the wild out here. I've got one in my front yard. On the way to the shops, there's one climbing up like a, a lamppost, right? Down the street, there's one climb up, climbing up a concrete wall. Deliciosas don't necessarily need the moss in the moss pole for support or climbing purposes, but I just do that for propagation purposes. Very, very different story to like a philodendron verocosum, for example, who is really appreciating the moss aspect of the moss pole because it really loves growing in moss as a growing medium and it has really, really fine aerial roots. You will never ever see a thick root like that on a verocosum that's sticking out. Those roots are full on taking advantage of the moss within the moss pole. So you don't need a moss pole for all of your plants. Really consider the growth pattern of the plant, consider what kind of roots this plant has, but also consider how much optimization you want to do. With a moss pole, it probably grows better than without a moss pole, but it's not necessarily necessary, if that makes sense. I feel like I was just waffling on. In a nutshell, what I'm saying is like climbers, first and foremost, need support. Support can come from anything that is vertical. It can be a concrete wall. It can be a piece of wood. It can be a coca choir pole and so on. It doesn't need to be a moss pole to make it climb. The climbing aspect is really in its nature. The aerial roots will pretty much attach to anything if you have high humidity. But what is going to happen when that plant reaches the top? Are you going to cut your wall in half and then extend it? Like, no, you would have to rip it off the wall, which basically rips all of the root system in half. Um, so I really appreciate the propagation aspect of the moss pole when it comes to my monsteras. 
but the monsteras in themselves wouldn't probably need moss as a growing medium to actually thrive and mature. Light is really the most important. Anyway, let's move through the kitchen a little bit. Actually, before we move into the kitchen, whoa, my Xalis is still going strong. I'm still shaking it and it still hasn't died despite the fact that I'm shaking it on a weekly basis. So maybe, maybe there's something about it. <laughs> All right, now let's move through into the kitchen. I don't have too many plants in the kitchen because I need room for cooking in the kitchen as well. It actually gets really, really nice light during summer. So north is pretty much exactly in this corner over here. So you are now facing east. You are now kind of in that east facing window. So you are facing west. And that window over there, you can see is then northwest. Right? So... Well, not that northwest, the different northwest. <laughs> um, so yeah, it gets a lot of nice sun. During winter, I actually get sunset coming through. So during winter, the sun from this window hits the back wall over there because the sun is so low. In summer, the sun doesn't really get any further than my sink. So I get more light during, again, same thing as with the other window. I get more direct light during winter, but the light isn't quite as harsh. In summer, I get more sunlight hours, but the sun in itself is more indirect. So kind of perfect. Anyway, the reason I don't have that many plants in here is not because the light isn't perfect, but actually because I use this as a kitchen. I do cook and I clean. This is my Syngonium mojito, and I just repotted this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I just uploaded, it would have been the last video you might have seen, and it is already showing some roots over here so it is really liking the new substrate i have decided to not give this a moss pole because i don't really have a desire to make this plant re grow really large or really tall i kind of want to have it being a little bit bushier and just filling the spice right next to it is my alocasia jacqueline and i don't know it's honestly it's not dying it's happy it's not droopy. Usually with alocages, they get droopy, you know, but it's, it's happy. It's just honestly not growing. It's such a slow grower. And I think I'm not the only one. I think I heard people say this on the internet. Um, two more things in here. This is my miscellaneous pot of alocages. So still going strong, going happy. Um, I love growing these jewel alocasias because they seem to be the only ones that aren't absolute crazy spider mite magnets. Love this new black velvet leaf, They're very pretty. Platinum dragon, green dragon, silver dragon, and black velvet, I think. This is a Paraiso Verde that I got from Bunnings just really recently. So really excited to see that they have some nice plants in stock. And I only potted this up on the Mospo last week week and you can already see the first root going in there i don't know if you can see that down here the first root is already making contact with the moss and growing into the moss pile beautiful and there's some roots inside the pot as well so oh there's already one coming out jeez so that's why I love using these see-through pots because I can see whether my repot was successful or not. I can see whether the plant is taking to the new medium or not. You know, I don't need to guess and hope that everything is fine. I know it for a fact because the plant is telling me through its root system. So much fun actually looking at the roots as well as looking at the leaves, right? You've got twice as much things to look forward to. All right, let's move over here. Oh my God, hang on, quick cuddle break. I was distracted by this cutie pie. Alrighty, let's talk a little bit more about the room in itself. As I mentioned, that was the northeast facing window. And then this big door over there is northwest facing. So I get sunrise and then sunset in summer is here. Sunset in winter is more like here. So during winter, I get the full sunset hitting that back wall over here and full sunrise hitting that back wall over here whereas in summer so the season we're currently in because um in the southern hemisphere so keep in mind it's the opposite to everything on the northern hemisphere during summer the sun kind of rises more here and then moves up in the sky really quickly and then sets over here so i don't get a lot of direct sun exposure during summer 
but I get a lot of bright indirect light and I definitely get the heat from summer, of course. So it is kind of working out perfectly. If I would get more direct sun, it would just be unbearably hot in here. I do not have air conditioning. I don't really need air conditioning. To be honest, I have so many plants at this stage. They're kind of keeping the temperature at like a decent level. I think, what is it right now? <laughs> okay, it's actually 27 degrees apparently in here. It doesn't feel like 27 degrees, let me tell you that. Like, it doesn't feel that. Actually, that, that, hang on, that's wrong. It's 25, sorry. It's 25 degrees Celsius right now, which is not that bad for Australia, honestly. It's not that bad. Probably outside, it's like 35, probably. And in the sun, it's probably 45. So it's not actually that bad given the amount of sun and light I get. I don't actually get too much heat. But in winter, because the sun is much lower and it hits through the windows, I actually get a lot of heat from the sun during winter, which then keeps my heating costs um, quite low. So I love this apartment. All right, so that was kind of light and temperature. But the other things we all worry about as plant parents is, temp uh, is humidity and airflow. Hopefully you're worried about airflow. I reckon most of you will forget about airflow. So humidity is probably the one thing that everybody talks about because humidity is the hardest part to achieve indoors. Now we've had yet again, quite a wet summer. Last week, for example, the average humidity outside was between 80 to 85%. So if I open my windows, it's going to be 80 to 85% of humidity in here as well. So during those weeks, I basically never even closed my windows. My windows are open at all times. Happy days that then also saw uh, that then also sorts out the airflow. So constantly exchanging the air a little bit, getting fresh air in here, or well, I suppose the plants probably want a little bit of stale air so they can transform it into beautiful fresh air and oxygen. Today it is thirty percent humidity, and I don't control humidity. Whatever it is outside, it will be inside as well. It's actually twenty eight percent, so it's twenty eight percent humidity, which what do you want me to do? It is what it is. It's not perfect. If I could choose, I would choose 60% consistently, but that's, that's life, right? I mean, in this room, it is impossible for me to control humidity. I can't have eight humidifiers in here. I would basically just create puddles on the floor. I don't really like the use of humidifiers. I think by now these plants have all grown in this environment for so long. They've gone through multiple seasons. They're used to it, right? This is the environment that they're used to, so they're okay with it. But I'm definitely happy when it's raining next time around, and so the humidity gets a bit of a boost again. Anyway, that was basically just about the conditions because I know you guys are going to ask what conditions these plants grow in. Ultimately, if I would have if I would have filmed this video last week, I would have told you that they're growing in 80% humidity. If I would film it today, I'll tell you that it's growing in 30% humidity. So why don't we agree on approximately 50? <laughs> so I think that's a good, uh, it's a good compromise. But I also have a fan, of course, but that is mainly for me. But a fan is always a good option to add airflow into your space where you grow a lot of plants if you don't have the luxury of being able to keep your windows open a lot. This is a no ID plant. So it just doesn't have an ID. I was given this plant by... I, I bought a plant and the seller just chucked that plant into the same packet saying that they would love for me to grow this plant. It was a hybrid that they created between some random philodendron and they would love for me to grow this and see how big it can grow in my environment. Now that was very nice of that seller but you guys know how picky I am with my plants and which plants I decide to keep and which plants I decide not to keep. I can't grow all of the plants in the world just to see what it would look like growing in my environment. So I have grown it obviously for a while now and look, I don't mind this plant. I think it's pretty cute, but to me, it's probably not a plant that is worth the real estate in my apartment. So that's why I gave it kind of a darker corner, which is then also not enabling it to really grow to its full potential. So it's kind of like this, I probably should give it a better spot so I can see what it could grow into. But then which other plant do I take out of that good spot, right? Do I say, okay, bye Monstera Dubia, you got to go make room for this plant. I don't even know if I want to grow it. So yeah, 
I don't know. <laughs> it's just there now. Then over here, I've got my Monstera Siltipecana. I have no feelings about this plant. I don't know. I mean, I like it. It was one of my first plants. I would probably not get it again if I would not have it already. But because I already have it, it fills the space nicely, right? And it just realized it's like the darkest corner of my apartment. That's why I put the IKEA cabinet here because the IKEA cabinet doesn't need to be in a, in a bright spot. And then this one is really just relying on that excess light from the IKEA cabinet. Now let's have a look at the cabinet in itself. I was about to say that I got rid of a lot of plants in the cabinet by looking at it. It doesn't actually look like I got rid of a lot of plants, but a lot of the anthuriums that used to live in here now moved into my anthurium room. So I'm really glad I made that decision because it's still really full, despite the fact that I moved a good three to four plants out of here. The main reason it's so full is really the queen anthurium over here, and that's its newest leaf. It's still really, really soft and vulnerable, so I'm trying to not touch it. But I reckon this leaf will get bigger than this leaf over here. So it should it's probably going to be about this this big. So let's see. Disappointment of the year. I've got my variegated Adansonii over here. And it's just not really doing anything but pushing out full white leaves. But I've got a full video on that coming soon. So I don't want to say too much. It's one of my own hybrids. It's really nice. As a, as a, I made a hybrid out of the crystallinum that I've got. Uh, super, super nice. Actually, I really love this plant. And it's special because... I did this. Then I've got a few little seedlings over here. They're really loving their top spot in my IKEA cabinet because they get a lot of light. But this little shade cover that I built from a coat hanger and shade cloth is just giving it like that perfect, bright, indirect light. But really, really consistent humidity. Like it's like 90% in here. Right? Uh, really consistent humidity, consistent light level, consistent airflow. So the consistency is just making these little seedlings really thrive. So any like smaller plant that I get, I try and like grow in the cabinet first so it can really, um, you know, recover from any shock that it might had coming to my place or shock from repotting. And then once it is growing in the IKEA cabinet, then my next challenge is really slowly taking it out of the IKEA cabinet so it gets used to less than optimal conditions because it can't grow in there for forever, right? I'm going to run out of space. So eventually it has to move out of the cabinet. It's a thing that I'm just dreading to do with my queen because I just know that she will not be happy with, um, or she, she will not be happy with the drop in humidity, drop in consistency as soon as I move it out of here. Now, basically, when I move it out of here, I then would put it in my anthurium room or my bedroom first because it's a smaller room. So the consist like the temperatures and everything in there are more consistent, don't fluctuate quite as much. And only once they're used to one of those rooms, then I start moving them into my living area because in the living area, as I said before, it can be 85% humidity and the next day it could be 30. Uh, it could be a lot of bright, direct sunlight in the morning and the next day it could just be raining and there's no light at all. There are way more challenges the plant would have to deal with in my living area compared to the cabinet or the other two rooms that I'll show you later on. So it's kind of like a progressive building of resilience, if that makes sense. Next to it, we have my Billy. Um, a lot of people were really surprised when I gave my Billy a moss pole because you don't often see billies growing on moss poles. <clears throat> billies definitely can grow in a little bit more of a cluster. But, I mean, I've given it a moss pole and you can see that it has definitely attached to the moss pole. It is definitely climbing and the roots have grown into the moss pole and all the way out of the moss pole. Which means that really this whole moss pole is, <laughs> I feel like I sound like a broken record, it's a vertical extension of your pot, right? <clears throat> that doesn't happen with a plank. If that would be on a piece of wood or on a coca choir pole, yes, the plant would grow these aerial roots and they would anchor or like it, they would help anchor the plant to the support. That's why they also grow up. So they kind of like in real life, they would anchor themselves on a, on the tree. But because they are anchoring themselves on the moss pole and I keep the moss pole moist, the moss is actually a growing medium. So these are water roots. These are proper is a proper part of like the, the root system. They're not just anchoring roots or aerial roots to kind of attach 
um, the plant to its host. And <clears throat> right next to that, we've got my Cupria. I have to say the Cupria hasn't really done much over the last almost year or so. It had a phase where it was just growing and growing and growing. And then it had a phase where it just gives me a lot of flowers, which is really disappointing because obviously the plant puts a lot of effort into growing flowers and that's just not what I want. So I cut them off. But it currently has three shoots on the way. So if I turn it around, there's a new leaf coming here, a new leaf coming here, and a new leaf coming here. So maybe it's happy. I mean, it's definitely happy. Otherwise, it would be dead. Right? But not all plants grow all the time like crazy. Right? Sometimes they go through a bit of a growth spurt, and then they're like, you know what? I'm happy. All right, let's move to this side of the apartment. And as you can see, it's pretty full. Actually, let's maybe address this plant right in the middle. That is my Discoria discolor. And as you can see, it is the closest to the window. And I don't mind that at all because I get to look at these beautiful red backs. But I think to make this a good video, you should probably be on the other side because you probably can't see all too much filming against the light right now. Alrighty, this is what she looks like from the other side. So again, I uploaded a video specifically about this plant quite recently. This grew like that from an empty pot in just two months. A lot of people called BS on it, saying that it's impossible, but quite clearly, those people probably have never grown a vegetable. This is actually a yam. It's called ornamental yam. So it grows exactly like a yam or like a vegetable, a potato, a sweet potato would grow. And you would know that they go dormant during winter. And then when growing season hit, it's freaking go time, right? It's got no time to waste because it's only going to grow through half the year. So when it grows, it grows extremely fast. I don't understand why people would think I would be lying. Like, what that would make no sense why would i have to lie about these plants if this would take three years to grow like that it would still be a nice plant so i don't understand why i would be lying about the time frame to i don't know it wouldn't necessarily make me look like a good grower it would just make me look like a liar right so anyway <sighs> the internet people obviously never believe in the good in people or people always just think people want the worst for everybody else. But I actually have good intentions. Surprise, I'm actually not here to just lie to you. I'm actually here to tell you the truth about my plant journey so you can learn from it. So anyway, really nice plant, but let's move on because I've already spoken enough about this plant. But I'll move it out of the way because it kind of... <laughs> blocks everything else. Okay. Let's address the mess behind these plants first. So you guys know I like my climbers. I do love some crawlers as well, but I'm always like, I'm going back and forth between do I love crawlers or do I hate them? Like I love the leaves one at a time and each by itself, I love the leaves. But as like a arrangement i just find climbers so messy with like super long petioles going in all direction the leaves are facing in all sorts of directions it's just taking up so much space it is a very horizontal spread rather than it being nice and vertical so i'm really struggling to make it fit into the aesthetic of my apartment or fit it in with the rest of my jungle and still make it look nice while giving it a spot where it actually thrives in like I'm having the hardest time kind of like integrating my crawlers into my plant collection. So <laughs> I decided to just hide them in a corner so I don't have to look at them because they were honestly just really getting me angry. On a daily basis, I looked at them. And I was like, I don't like the way you look. And it's just like, why would I put so much time and effort and waste space on something that I don't enjoy growing or looking at? So I was like, you know what, let's put them in that corner. Let's do as little as possible. And if they turn around and they kind of start looking nice, then they're allowed to stay. If, <laughs> if they don't come to the party, if they don't kind of like get there together, then bye. As I mentioned before, I don't get a lot of sunlight deep into the room during summer. The sun really just kind of exactly where you are right now that's as deep as the sun will get. So 
this part of the room in winter would get actually a lot of bright light from the sun being so low. But in, in summer, it's one of the darkest spots of my apartment. So it's not kind of useful, um, really. So I took one of my older grow lights. It's just an Ikea grow light in an Ikea lamp um, that I had left over after I redid my second bedroom. So I just took that grow light and I kind of put it here and I have all of the crawlers in that corner and they're all now just being looked after by that one grow light. I mean, they get the tiniest little bit of bright indirect light or like not so bright indirect light from the window in itself, but most of the light would kind of be absorbed by these big leaves in front of it. Let me show you. So far, they don't seem to mind. Like this is the latest Dean McDowell leaf and it only unfurled and grew this since it's been living here. So, I mean, this is a beautiful leaf. As I said, I love each leaf individually, but as a collection, these long petioles, like I try and tame them with some twine and a stake. And I mean, there's another leaf coming there. So obviously they are happy, but I'm not. <laughs> and look, ultimately this is my apartment. So I need to be happy with them. I spend a lot of time looking after these plants. If a plant doesn't make me happy, then well, but let's talk about plants that do make me happy. For example, this Ataba Poenzi. So you might have remembered me chopping the Ataba Poenzi and then sort of just extending the top of the pole. I actually took both poles, I potted them both up and then just extended one. And that worked such a treat. So I now have two plants growing on that main vine. So this is the main plant. And then this is the secondary plant that is growing on here as well. So basically doubling the impact. This plant is also crazy when it comes to rooting. This plant, same as the billy, is actually growing roots up the moss pole. And this was the bottom part of the moss pole. So I put them both next to each other, but I only ex extended one of them. And can you see there's roots? Actually, they're growing out of the bottom part and then growing back into the second part, the extension. So they've grown from this pole into this pole. And now they're sticking out the top of the extension. Up here, they're sticking out over here. So this plant roots like crazy, which is great. We love roots. The more roots, the more water and nutrients the plant can absorb for hopefully nice growth. Actually, I noticed that the plant was really dry. So I'm just going to quickly give it a water. Stay with me. There you go. That's honestly as easy as it is. So like I walk around the apartment and I look at my plants all the time anyway, because that's why I grow them for. I love looking at these leaves. And then when I notice that a plant is dry, I just flip a bottle upside down. That's it. That's why I don't necessarily have like a definitive frequency. It changes. I just wing it as we go. All right, let's focus on these plants on my right. So on the left of your screen. So nothing really changed over here since the last time we spoke. It's still kind of my setup for my smaller poles. Um, Maybe one that I want to point out is this one over here. This is my Berlamax Fantasy. It is kind of a slow grower, but that's okay. Like I actually appreciate it. It gives me a bit of a break. It doesn't need that much maintenance. But one thing that nobody ever talks about, like I didn't know, uh, even until I had one myself, is it actually has a bit of texture. It's one of these things that just don't really come across on camera, which it's just the reason why all plants always are so much nicer in, in real life. All right, then down here, I've got a few um, other plants. This is a ring of fire. Again, people were really surprised that I put my ring of fire on a moss pole, but you can see how like a little bit, I mean, it's not grown much yet, but you can see how it's really slowly climbing. It hasn't fully attached to the moss pole yet, but it will. This is another unknown hybrid. And from a growth pattern perspective, it looks very similar to, let's say, for example, the Ring of Fire, right? More clumpy. But have a look at this. It sent out roots from its node and the roots grown into the moss pole. And then they seem to be growing up the moss pole as well. So even if the plant isn't really using the moss pole to proper climb on, the plant can still use the moss pole as a vertical extension of the pot. So the plant can grow a whole lot of roots in there 
and that prevents you from having to use really large large pots but also for me personally i have never had root rot in a moss pile i have definitely had root rot in a pot so to me any root that's growing in a moss pile is also like an insurance that in case things go south i feel like there's two root systems one within the moss pile and one within the pod so both of them would have to be completely dead so that I can't really rescue the plant, if that makes sense. So it's almost like a security. And then right next to it, I've got a Syngonium Steyermachii. You know, it's not, it's definitely increasing in leaf size really slowly, which is good. I'm not, I mean, if I would want to see this plant mature faster, I would definitely have to give it more light. I have more light in my apartment, but I would have to put it, like another spot would ha another plant would have to take a step back so right now i'm really happy for this plant to just grow slowly right like as long as it's increasing leaf size i know that it's on the right track now it might take a year to get to the plant that i actually want to have rather than half a year or three quarters of a year but that's okay i've got time like you know it's Hobby is also teaching me patience and ultimately it's more about the journey than the end result. Plants keep changing. This is probably the third or fourth houseplant tour that I'm filming and in every houseplant tour my plants look different. This plant for example, last houseplant tour I was filming was at the very top of its moss pole. Probably looked more impressive than it looks right now because it has half the amount of leaves right now. That's okay. Like eventually I have to chop it. That plant is not going to stop growing. I got to do something about it, right? These are all plants. Like then I, or I at least think that I need to maintain them so that they look nice and neat and they don't just actually overtake my apartment. While I do love a urban jungle aesthetic, my urban jungle aesthetic is still very neat or at least for me. I don't know. People have different understandings of the word neat. Now, I like to be fairly neat and I like to be organized and I like to be structured in the way that I put my urban jungle together. If, you, if that's not your approach, that's also totally fine. I've seen people that literally just let plants go wild and like let them crawl up their wall and their everything and there's just pot over pot over pot and like everything is a mess and every plant is a little bit outgrowing and it's kind of like leans to this side and like has like a bunch of leaves over here and some there and so on if that's the aesthetic that you're after because you love the really wild unruly look then go for it right aesthetics are different tastes are different i love more structure and i don't really work or my brain doesn't operate too well in a super messy space so despite the fact that i have a lot of plants and creating like a bit of an urban jungle atmosphere i still think it's fairly neat or like neat enough for me to operate in here <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know if that made sense anyway again each to their own though i'm not saying that there's only one way to grow plants i'm just saying this is my way of growing plants and if you like my way of growing plants then i have plenty of videos that teaches you my approach all right, let's have a look at this one. It's Monstera Siltipicana El Salvador, and it reached the top of its moss pole just last week. And I was supposed to do a normal chop and extend, and then I kind of like, I looked so empty, so I decided to take the bottom part of the pole and just pot it up as well. So I did the same with the El Salvador as I did with the Atabapuense. These two, so this was the bottom part of the pole, this was the top part of the pole, I took the top part of the pole and I potted it next to it and now I re-extended one of them. So the bottom part of the pole probably has like three or four shoots. The top part of the pole has about three shoots and only one has really made it to the top. So only one has now started climbing up the extension. And I don't want just one plant. I want it to be a lush display. So I'm hoping, so I know for a fact that all of these shoots on both uh, parts will reshoot and will continuously grow so hopefully eventually I'll have three or four shoots on that extension again and then I can do a normal chop and extend and in the meantime I have an extra lush plant I mean that's nice right alrighty and right, next to it we've got my uh, Adansonii uh, subspecies Laniata and that probably also looked more impressive in the last houseplant tour that I filmed because, well, I think it was probably closer to the top of its moss pole. I gave it a chop um, two, three weeks ago 
And I didn't just chop it, I chopped it and I also converted the pole from a normal moss pole to one of these plastic backed moss poles. Couple of reasons why. First of all, there's more room for roots in here. Second of all, it's gonna keep it moist for longer. And I think that's what this plant needs if I wanna see it mature further. I feel like it reached a bit of a dead end. Like it's not gonna grow any larger leaves unless I do something about it. And since then it is, I think this was already a new leaf since I chopped it. And now it's also giving me another new leaf over here. There are three shoots on here. The other two are a little bit further down, so they haven't really caught up to the main shoot yet. But to really assess whether the transfer to the grow vertical pole was a su success, I probably have to wait another couple of weeks, but I see a lot of roots already sneaking through. Um, or I can see a lot of roots already hitting the back panel of that moss pole over here. But I recorded the full transformation from normal moss pole to grow vertical moss pole, and I'm gonna have a separate video up on that. Next to it, we've got my Monstera Pinatipatita, another really slow grower. This plant has been on this moss pole for a long time, like a few years, I think, by now. That You can tell that this has been on this plant uh, pole for a long time because the pole has so much algae buildup <laughs> because it's been just the same pole for so long. In, in like the same time frame, my Adansonia, for example, would have probably gone through two chopping extents. So that moss pole would have been chopped like last year if it was the Adansonia. But that Pinatipatita seems to be growing really slow or, and with quite small internodal spacing. But it is starting to give me more and more fenestrations with each leaf, right? And so for a while it gave me like three fenestrations, then like five, and now it's one, two, three, four, so five, six, seven. So it's good. So it's definitely increasing. It's changing to a more mature leaf shape. Not necessarily in the speed that I would want it to change. Oh, this is super crunchy as well. One moment, please. To, my top tip to grow plants is if you notice something like that, like, oh, it's crunchy, I should water it, just do it now. Like, don't do it tomorrow or do it later. Like, if you notice it now, just do it. That way, you can't forget about it. Alrighty, and then next to that, I've got a variegated Monstera because you can't have enough of those. So all of the leaves you see over here, that was actually the base of a friend's plant that um, I cut for him, yay. And so none of these leaves have grown in my care, but since I've taken it on, it has given me two shoots. So it reshot down here, as well as at the top over here. And both shoots look very white, but not fully white, like a good mix between white and a little bit of green in it. Alrighty, welcome to the balcony. Um, the problem with my balcony, as you can probably tell, is that the conditions are really, really harsh. So north is exactly over there. So you're, face, you're basically facing north perfectly. And the sun rises here and then sets over here, which means that this balcony pretty much gets direct sun from 11 o'clock onwards uh, till sunset. So that is a lot of sun, <laughs> especially for Australia, where the sun can be really, really harsh, which means that I'm really limited with the plants that I can put out here or the plants that I put out here are really going to have to put up a fight to start surviving over here. So usually most plants that I put on here initially just die back. But then when they start growing new leaves, those new leaves are becoming more resilient to the conditions. It would be the perfect balcony for just a few cacti, but I do have a few cacti here as well, but ultimately I want this still to look really lush. Now, the good thing is the more plants I put here, the more shade the plants give each other. So at the beginning I had like two or three plants and they were like really exposed to that harsh sun. Also harsh winds, as you can see, it's pretty unobstructed. So there's absolutely nothing to stop the wind from going ham over here. That tree behind me, it's a native bottle brush tree that went flying a couple of times, like not flying, like off the balcony flying, but it was like flying, right? And like basically rolling over, but that's how harsh the winds can be over here as well. So, so it's definitely a challenge. What I've noticed though, canna lilies seem to be doing really well. I have had some, Caterpillars. I have no idea how the caterpillars got all the way up here, but I've had some caterpillars that started feeding on them a little bit. But apart from that, I love these canna lilies. They're giving me like variegated banana vibes. 
and that was so affordable i got bulbs i just honestly just i saw them at the royal botanical gardens and look at this leaf that is just so beautiful i saw them at the royal botanical gardens and i was like i got it i need one of those and i just googled it and i just i don't i don't remember where i got them from but honestly just the first hit in google was like yep you can buy bulbs over here i got one for 13 dollars, i think i potted it up and it just re it just shoots out itself like it I don't do anything. I haven't repotted it in a year and it just keeps growing new stems left, right and center. So it is super thirsty. So specifically with that hot sun and the wind, I water this pretty much daily. Um, what else do I have here with this chair and with the cushion? I'm trying to kind of shade it. So these are all of the plants that I'm just really putting out here to fight for their survival. So I've got some... So I've got some alocasias, for example, more alocasias, some symgoniums, um, more alocasias. Uh, oh my God, I can never remember this one. I just know its species name is Lin Lindenii. Uh, I mean, I kind of just put them out here so that they can fight for their survival because I just didn't have space for them inside. So I knew that if I keep them inside, I can't really give them enough light or the conditions that they need. So inside they would have died anyway, or I would have had to they would have died eventually. So I'm just giving them a second chance of life out on the balcony. And most of them actually come back eventually. I've got a few crawlers over here as well. Just some cuttings I took off crawlers. To be honest, because these crawlers, I just cannot stay on top of the spider mites with my crawlers. But out here, I feel like the conditions are honestly too harsh for even spider mites to be here. Same actually with the canna lily. I think if you remember my very first houseplant tour, that canna lily was still inside and I was honestly treating it for spider mites on a weekly basis. I put it out here and I've never seen a single spider mite ever again, right? Let nature just takes care of that. I feel like spider mites was just invented for indoor plant growers, like to piss us off. Oh, okay, that's the other side of the balcony. Honestly, like if I even say like the other side, it makes it sound like it's big. The balcony is maybe two meters long, two and a half meters long. It's honestly, it's not much to this balcony. This side gets a little bit more shade in summer, but it gets more light in winter. But you can tell that it gets more shade or like the conditions aren't quite as harsh because like plants like this Moranta, for example, that was an empty pot, an empty pot in September, is now looking like this also not a single time that i treated this for spider mites it's just chilling out here and it's doing it all by itself and inspired by this success oopsie bye inspired by the success i started putting more marantas out here and they all seem to be liking it so that's nice and another canna lily over here this is canna lily Cleopatra, I think. Um, it's looking a little bit sad at the moment because I just cut it back. Normally, what this canna lily is known for is being able to be green or red or both. So sometimes I have half, sometimes I have full red plants, sometimes full green plants, sometimes they're like half half. Unfortunately, right now, all of the red ones are dead. It's just this green one. But you can see this in this flower over here. You can still see how it has the potential to be red. So sometimes leaves are just like this half, half, and the flowers can also be half yellow, half red. Uh, but this one at the moment is just um, yellow, unfortunately. But we'll see what the next growing season will bring. Oh, and obviously like um, more hardy plants like this jade tree, they're also really, really happy over here. Um, during winter, it gets a little bit more sun stressed because as I said, during winter, it gets more light and it starts being a little bit more red, yellowish. During summer, it actually gets less light because the sun moves higher up and there is like a ceiling on this balcony. So it's not a fully exposed balcony. Um, yeah. All right, let's move back inside. It's way too sunny. All right, that was the living area. Definitely the most complex, complex of my environments because it is the largest area. It has exposure from multiple areas and well, this is also where I spend most of my time. So first and foremost, this also needs to work for me and like, you know, what I want to do in life. But there's also two bedrooms to this apartment I want to show you. So come on through. All right, really quick, let's talk about the setup. But I have separate videos on each of those rooms as well if you want to learn more about these rooms in detail. 
Same exposure as the living room window that we spoke about very first. So this is a northeast facing window. So north would be here, east is here. The sun kind of rises like this during winter, rises like this during summer. So during winter, I get a lot of direct sun on this wall over here, specifically during the morning. Not bad direct sun, like good direct sun, right? Like the nice the nice morning sun, right? It's not too harsh to actually burn these leaves, but it's bright enough to actually make an impact on these leaves. During summer, I get way less light exposure in this room. Sun moves high up. Basically, this part of the room, so from here towards the uh, window, gets almost like too much light, right? So this plant, for example, I like it to be here, but it would just get burned during the morning. So I have this on like just a little piece of wood so I can slide it back every morning when I wake up so it doesn't get burned. And then when the sun disappears or if it's not a rainy day in the, or if it's not a super sunny day in the first place, I'll slide it back. This is the only crawler that I am still happy with. It is my narrow form Plowmanii. I just think it is such a beautiful plant. Beautiful backs, nice ruffled petioles. It crawls really, really slowly with small internodal spacing. So it doesn't take up too much space or needs like a super large planter as well. And it seems to be maturing really quickly. Hey, I got distracted. I was talking about the room. So basically, great natural light during winter, not so great natural light during summer. That's why I have these two grow lights over here. I have sp a specific video on these grow lights. These are mother grow lights and I also have a discount code Sydney plant guy and I'll leave all of the information for you below in the description if you want to learn more about these lights. These lights are really to supplement the light kind of from here towards the, wa uh, the wardrobe where I just don't get that much natural light. Right? If we compare that to my living room, in the living room, I have another window on this wall, right? So I get exposure from both sides. In this room, I only get exposure in the morning, no light during the afternoon, or like a little bit of bright indirect light from this window. But really, again, just take care of these plants closest to it. So basically, anything that you see to my right, on your left, is purely reliant on these grow lights. Um, so I'm not going to give you a lux or foot candle reading. I'm just giving you the proof that it's actually working. I think that is much more important than a number. Right. And then as the last thing from a setup perspective in this room, I have a Dyson. It is a hot, cool purifier. So in winter, it's a heater, which I usually, which is like my main usage of it. So during winter, I can, for example, tell it I want to keep this room at 20 degrees Celsius all day long. And then it just turns itself on and off as required to actually heat the room to, to that temperature. At the same time, every time it is either used as a fan or as a heater, it actually purifies the air, which I don't really need. I have so many plants. I reckon I've got the purest air in all of Sydney anyway. But uh, I don't know, it was just, it, this is just how it comes. And then in summer, I can also use this as a fan. It doesn't, it's not air conditioning, so it's not going to cool the air. It's just a fan, so it keeps the air moving. But I can also program that, you know, I can say like, oh, turn on every hour or so. I personally don't, I'm just saying you could. I honestly mainly rely on just having the window open for airflow, but when if I, if I, for example, take my plants to the bathtub and I give them a spray and there's like le um, little water droplets sitting on all of the leaves, I would definitely turn on the fan, just let it uh, like, you know, rotate 360 degrees so that all of these water droplets can evaporate from the leaves and not cause any harm. So uh, fungal issues would be a problem if water keeps sitting on your leaves. That's why never ever and underestimate airflow. Anyway, I'll take the Dyson down so you can see the plants behind it a little bit better. All right, sorry, I just took the lazy router and I just got a chair. I've been standing on my feet all day already. I've done a lot of watering this morning before I started filming this. So this room is like my wall of poles. This is like my, where all of my favorite plants live and they're mainly velvet philodendrons. Um, 
Why? Well, because it's a smaller room, I can control the environment in this room a little bit better just purely with purely via opening and closing a window or opening and closing a door, for example. So if I'd close the door and the window, the humidity in this room can uh, increase just purely based on the plants that are here. Right now it's 50% humidity in here no humidifier in use if we compare that to the 30% humidity that were in the living room. It is purely based on this being a smaller room filled with plants. So the plants kind of create their own humidity. Now 50% humidity is nothing to be concerned about, but whenever you have a more humid environment, I would definitely encourage you to make sure that you keep your airflow up, not just for the sake of your plants, predominantly for your own sake and the sake of your apartment. But I have never had any sort of mold issues in my apartment over here, despite the fact that I have a lot of plants, but I am making a big effort of making sure I always air out the room, always have my window open, get some fresh air in here, have the fan on, keep the room really nice and tidy and clean and dust free as well. Alrighty, so um, obviously these are, this, most of these larger plants you can see over here, they've been with me for two to three years already. So they've gone through two or three chopping extents. If you're not familiar with my chopping extents, I basically, when the plant reaches the top of the moss pile, chop it, pot it back up, we extend it, right? So these plants, if it wasn't for the chopping extent, would probably be like three to four meters tall by now, but obviously that's unrealistic in an indoor setting. So to keep them at a manageable height, I keep chop and extending them. So that, that way, even like the, the bottom leaf of these plants already looks quite mature. It's because they're not actually the bottom leaves. They used to be the top leaf. I just cut it and then repotted it and so on. So that, that system or that process of chop and extending is really what enables me to grow all of these plants in my apartment. This is really like the main thing I do and everything I do is optimized so that the chop and extend can happen later on. So if you're not familiar with it, I definitely recommend you check out my chop and extend tutorial in my moss pole playlist. Alrighty, let's look at some of these plants in a little bit more detail. So this is my Philodendron Splendid, a hybrid of Rarocosum and Mil Milano Chrysum. And as it was unfurling, it just scraped across my wardrobe over here and kind of hurt itself. So I'm a little bit sad, but it's still a huge leaf, bigger than the last one. So I know that the plant in itself is happy, right? It was just a little bit of a, a bit of mechanical damage as it was unfurling, which is normal. These are leaves. If you're after perfect leaves that never yellow, that never have like a tear or a break, then you're probably better off going for fake plants, honestly. Like these are real life plants. They're living organisms. They, sh they change, they grow, they can also die. Right next to it, I've got my Philodendron Sodiroi, also with a new leaf over here. It still has a little bit of silver, which makes me happy, but I'm expecting that with the next couple of leaves, all of the silver, silver should disappear, which is a little bit sad, but whatever. Next to that, we've got my Verocosum over here. You guys know my Verocosum is my all-time favorite plant, however, at the moment, I'm a little bit upset with it because it had a bit of spider mite damage that I was a little bit late to get on top of. So the leaves aren't looking their best and it's summer at the moment. It really doesn't like summer as much. In nature, these grow in high altitude cloud forests. So it's really humid, but it's never hot. Like it's never hot, like 30 degrees hot. Another thing that comes with this room, because it's small, light also heats up much quicker. So when the sun hits in the morning, for example, and I close the door, it can go re it can really, really hot in here really quickly. Because it's so hot, then the humidity drops as well, because hot air can absorb more water. So the relative humidity of the room drops. And I think that is just not really to the Verocosum's liking. It's going to have a field day when winter comes around the corner, because winter in Sydney is actually really mild. So this is like, it's perfect time man which is okay gives other plants a moment to shine as i said again plants keep changing just because the varicosum looked amazing last year doesn't mean that it's going to look amazing for the rest of its life it's going to stop looking amazing the second i stop taking care of it and even if i take care of it there are other factors like the environment and pests that can impact the way the plant looks but again we're not um, i'm personally not growing plants for the end result i'm growing it for the journey and like the fun it brings me. But of course I do appreciate the end result. 
All right, this is my philodendron glorious, by far the most, the, by far the biggest plant in my collection. This is its new leaf, just unfurled. So this is going to have a lot of um, inflating to do. Or it's going to grow up a little bit more. Um, this was the leaf before that. I don't know if you can see it, but it is a large leaf. So overall, this is a very large plant. It's, a, it's definitely a special commitment. It has really long petiole. This leaf, for example, obviously the petiole ends here and it started here. So the petiole is like, what? Well, there's probably a meter or so. So I take the petioles and I tie them using twine to the moss pole. So the moss pole doesn't just provide a vertical extension of the root, uh, a vertical extension of the pot to host a lot of roots. It also kind of just helps me style my plants and make them into some nice compact versions of themselves so that they don't take up too much space. Otherwise, this plant by itself would easily love to take up half the wall. But, well, you better learn how to share. Okay. Next to it, we've got my Philodendron Milano Chrysum. It just had a chop and extend as well. Hasn't really done much since the chop and extend, but also hasn't died since the chop and extend. So I suppose I'll stay patient. And then next to that, we've got my um, Geigers. Now, let me show you. These leaves down here grew during winter. I really like these, actually. These leaves over here grows during summer. So I actually think the winter growth is much nicer than the summer growth. Reason for that is it is so close to the window. It honestly just gets a bit burned during summer. Like it gets too much sun. Um, I could obviously move it away, but then I have to move another plant there. So it's kind of like, I don't know, I'm just... It's the plant I have chosen to get burned, okay? I mean, despite the fact that it gets burned, it still looks okay. These markings you can see on these leaves are actually spider, it's actually spider mite damage. So, yeah, not happy with this plant at the moment, but I, I think it's, it's still growing. So, I mean, obviously the damage is never going to reverse in hindsight. All I can do is just ignore it and just make it, keep, make it happy again, keep growing it and look forward to the next few leaves and hopefully... Make sure that the spider mites come, don't come back, may, hope from, hoping that they're not going to burn um, any further than they already are. Maybe move them back a little bit, but then it's kind of not getting enough light. So it's been a bit of a challenge with this plant and the harshness of the sun that it is exposed to right here. But despite all of the adversity I put it through, it still seems to be growing quite nicely. But it has seen better days, right? It is definitely like the harshest time of the year over here at the moment, which means that, yeah, some plants will suffer a little bit. That is totally fine. There sometimes seems to be this misconception online that like, no matter what I do, all of my plants just miraculously thrive. Like that is totally not the case. Like I actually put a lot of effort into growing all of these plants. Like, I mean, obviously they grow by themselves, but I put a lot of effort into keeping them clean, making sure that they're in the right spot, assessing whether they're in the right spot, changing the spot and reassessing um, and, and, and so on, right? And the thing that makes them actually thrive and the thing that makes them mature is just the consistency. This is nothing that I just do like once or twice. I have been watering this plant every single week, sometimes multiple times a week for three years, right? If I would stop for two weeks, this plant would be dead. So it's not necessarily about what I do right now. It's way, way more about what have I done over the last three years, which also means that if you're just joining this plant hobby, like be realistic with the expectations on your plants. Like you can't just start the hobby and expect to be surrounded by a wall of poles within a month or two, right? This has taken me three years of continuous growth, continuous uh, caretaking to get there. And if I'd stop for three weeks, all of it would be gone, right? So it is much more about the journey and it's much more about the consistency than it is about having that end result because that end result can just fizzle really quickly. Now, this is where I used to stop my apartment tours, but if you've subscribed to my channel, you might have seen a more recent video where I transformed my spare room into an Arthurian room. So let's get a little update on that room as well. Follow me.
Alrighty, this is the Anthurium room. So let me give you a quick update. Let's maybe start with this shelf over here. All right, because I've only really recently made up this room and gave you a full tour of the room and like the way that I set it up and so on. I don't want to go into detail about every single plant, but I just want to show you how much new growth there is. Right? So if we are looking at this plant, it's an Anthurium Magnificum ex Forgetii. Two new shoots over here, so it's definitely happy. Over here is a Magnificum hybrid. This leaf has grown since it's in the new room and I think it is finished unfurling. Um, but it's still a little soft. Over here is my Clavinarium. I only repotted that a couple of weeks ago and it has also given me its first new leaf. In my Anthurium room video, this leaf just unfurled. It is now hardened off. This is a Crystallinum hybrid and I love this leaf. I don't know. The veining seems so like sophisticated. I don't know. <laughs> Alrighty. Next to it, we've got a Christ, uh, a Clarinervium hybrid. That's the one that AJ gave me for Christmas and that's its first leaf in my care. I still haven't repotted it. It's still an AJ's mix, but I know I can trust AJ compared to the mix that Bunnings producers, for example, can't trust them. Alrighty, another Magnificum hybrid with a new leaf over here. Of course my VGI hasn't produced anything because it hates me, but this other Clarinervium hybrid has also produced a new leaf since it's been repotted. And it, I only repotted that also in a video recently. Sorry, I only just watered that today as well, so make a mess. But look at these roots that have grown in just one week. No, sorry, 10 days, around 10 days. And then at the top, my Bosworth Beauty has also started growing a new leaf. So plenty of new growth, which really makes me think that these plants are liking the room. Keep in mind with the footage that you're looking at right now, I don't think it really comes across how bright it is in here. You notice it much more how bright these grow lights actually are during during night or like at night time when it goes dark you really notice how much light these lights actually produce and how it fills the space during the day when there's still light coming from the window by the way exact same window as in my bedroom so I'm not giving you the same spiel again um, when there's still light coming through from the window it kind of de deters from the light that these lights give up at least on camera like you know and cameras have like a weird way of adjusting light levels so I noticed that when I was editing that uh, the last video, it seems much darker on film than it actually is in person. But after all, again, I don't really, it's really hard to judge light levels through a camera or even through your eyes. I also think that light meters aren't necessarily the best way to measure light. Um, I think the best measure of light is the results. Proof is in the pudding. Then I've got another Magnificum over here. This is um, also, I grew this one from seed, has super nice, like almost like neon veining. I don't know if that comes across on the camera. Um, my puppy is sending out a new shoot over here. So it is definitely growing and happy. This is my big crystalline and my very first anthurium I've ever had. And this was the first leaf. It was already unfurling as I set up the room. Because I was moving it around quite a bit while I was setting up, there's been a few scars where I bumped into it. When these leaves are really small, any little mark is just going to turn into a scar as the leaf unfurls. But overall, I mean, that veining on this leaf, very nice produce my own little anthurium seedlings. So this, this whole pot over here is basically little babies of this crystallinum. And yeah, I mean, you can see there's so many new leaves coming everywhere. So it's definitely liking it in here as well. And then down here, this uh, are Magnificum hybrids. Also all just potted in one big pot because I cannot be asked to actually separate them. And you can also see a lot new leaves coming out uh, since I put it in this room. These are more of my own seedlings. I just repotted them into this pot. So you'll see a lot of leaves yellowing. That's because it would go through a little bit of shock, but you also see some new leaves growing. So that's happy days. 
these are hybrids of the very first anthurium that I showed you. So this one over here, this one pollinated with itself. Those were actually the anthurium seeds that are pollinated and cleaned and then potted up in my anthurium pollination video. So those were just little seedlings in that video, or like those were just little berries and seeds in the video. And now they're actually cute little seedlings. So it is happening. I have an Alocasia regal shield in the corner over there, and it has produced a new leaf over here. This plant can grow really, really large. So I don't think it's a bad thing that is kind of like in the darkest corner of the room because that kind of keeps it in check a little bit. It spreads so much. Like I honestly don't know what to do with it. I don't have room. Like in, if you just think about the room that it takes up horizontally, I could have had two or three moss poles there. So every time I have one of these plants that spreads like crazy, I just think about the opportunity cost of all of the moss poles that I now need to get rid of because it takes up so much space. And well, in the long run, usually the moss poles win. One more that I've got over here, and I'm also filming a video on this one at the moment. This one is still going through my onboarding process. So I only just recently got it and I potted it up on a moss pole maybe last week. So actually, let's have a look. I mean, it would be very quick if I could see some roots already. Ah, look at this! There you go. I can see the first root. That, I mean, these roots that you see here, they were already here after the repot. It came with a decent root system, but I want these new roots. I want to see these new white roots that are juicy. So it is clearly happy, which is good. Now I'm basically waiting for it to start attaching to its moss pole and I'm starting, I'm waiting for these leaves to start facing the front a little bit more. So I put it right in the window so that the light is coming from the front. There will be a little bit of yellowing. This plant was sent to me interstate. Um, so of course it went through a little bit of shock and then a repot in a brand new environment. So I'm totally not worried about yellowing leaves um, after I just onboarded the plant. Um, I'm more worried about roots. I want to see root growth because if it has a healthy root system, leaves are just a matter of time. If there are no roots, there won't be any leaves. Or if there are leaves and there's no roots, then the leaf will die really quickly. Alrighty, that was it. That was my entire apartment and all of the plants that I have within the apartment. Obviously, I didn't talk about every single plant. Otherwise, this video would be even longer than it already is. I just pointed out the ones that I thought would be interesting to talk about um, and the ones that changed uh, or grew a little bit since the last time I filmed one of these houseplant tours. I try and film one of those with every season, so there will be one for autumn, one for winter and so on, because every season comes with different challenges and plants respond differently to different seasons as well. So basically, hopefully within a year, you will have seen my houseplant collection throughout every season of the year. Brad wasn't too entertaining today. He didn't really want to come along. He's still sleeping on the couch, so I thought I'll leave him there, but I hope you still enjoyed this video. And if you did, I would love for you to check out my moss pole playlist. In that moss pole playlist, I have a lot of tutorials on how to make moss poles, how to water moss poles, how to pot up moss poles, to extend them, chop and extend them, and lots and lots of Q&A videos where I answer your frequently asked questions. So if you want to learn more about my actual care approach and how I manage to grow so many plants so nice and large, then that's the place to go. Again, thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, share, leave a nice comment, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.